Chapter 8 of The Darkening of Valinor So now the Valar think Melkor has gone back to one of his former strongholds in the north of Middle-earth, maybe Angband or the ruins of Utumno, and Orome and Tukas go looking for him. But they can't find him, because even though he was said to have gone north, at a certain point he actually turns around and goes south, so he tricks them. He makes his way far south, way down past Valinor on the eastern side of the Polori Mountains, to where the light of the trees doesn't go, in a place called Avatar. There, beneath the sheer walls of the mountains and the cold, dark sea, the shadows were deepest and thickest in the world. And there, in Avatar, secret and unknown, Ungoliant made her abode. We, we don't really know for sure where Ungoliant originally comes from. She is an evil spirit that Melkor corrupted a long time ago. But a long time ago, she disowned him and has been in Avatar ever since. She takes the form of a monstrous spider that eats light and then spins it out as dark, gloomy webs. When Melkor finds her in Avatar, he takes on the shape that he took when he ruled in Utumno, which is a giant, terrifying dark lord, not as a regal or majestic Vala like how he looked when he was still living in Valinor. And he convinces her to help him take revenge on the Valar by promising to give her anything she wants. She agrees, not knowing that he really only said that to get her to help him, but he doesn't really mean it. So she wraps, she wraps the both of them in a cloak of utter darkness, an unlight that no one can see through, kind of like a mini void. And they climb over the mountains and start heading north towards Valinor, and unseen by anyone or anything. Unfortunately, at this time, no one in Valinor is paying any attention to what Melkor might do. They kind of have their guard down because Manwe is holding a great feast in his halls on the top of the mountain Taniquatil, and everyone is invited. It's supposed to be where the Noldor reconcile with one another and forget about Melkor's lies. So here's who attends. All the Valar and Maiar, the Vanyar elves, and the Noldor of Tyrion. The Teleri don't come because they don't really care about what happens in Valinor proper. They're just hanging out by the sea, singing under the stars. They're so weird. <laughs> uh, Manwe has actually commanded Feanor to come, so Feanor shows up. But Finwe doesn't come, nor do any of Feanor's sons or his followers up at Formenos, so they all stay behind in Formenos. They don't come to the mountain. When Feanor arrives, he's not dressed up in the slightest. He looks like any other day. And of course he doesn't bring the Silmarils. Why would he do that? But uh, Fingolfin is, he's such a stand-up guy. He's a really nice guy, and he publicly shakes Feanor's hand and tells him that he forgives him. Then he says, half-brother in blood, full brother in heart will I be. Thou shalt lead, and I will follow. May no new grief divide us. Wow. And Feanor says, I hear thee, so be it. Y you're gonna see later on why Fingolfin should have just stopped at forgiveness and not made such a big promise to follow Feanor. That's a major theme in this book, the issue of making promises and vows that eventually turn out to have disastrous consequences like not really thinking ahead to what might happen. Just at that moment, when the two brothers reconcile, Melkor and Ungoliant arrive at the base of the two trees, and Melkor pierces their trunks with a spear. Then Ungoliant sucks out all their sap and actually poisons and withers their tissues so that once they're drained, the trees die. Then she drinks their shiny dew out of all the collection vats that are at the base of the trees. And she, as she drinks, she grows larger and larger, belching out black vapors. And even Melkor is a little scared. He's, he doesn't really know what to think at some point. She keeps growing. A darkness then f falls upon Valinor. In that hour was made a darkness that seemed not lack 
but a thing with being of its own, for it was indeed made by malice out of light, and it had power to pierce the eye, and to enter heart and mind, and strangle the very will. So this darkness spreads throughout Valinor like an inky sea, leaving Taniquitil alone, kind of like an island in this black sea. Only Manwe can see through the darkness, and even then, all he can see is the dark cloak of Ungoliant and Melkor moving north. Orome and Tulkas try to go after them, but they can't see where they're going, it's too dark. And when the darkness finally dissipates, eh, it's too late. Melkor and, and Ungoliant have escaped successfully. This time, they really did go to the north. So let me, just as an aside, let me give you an idea of the time scale. Uh, starting from the very moment the first elves arrived in Amon, all the way up until the trees are destroyed, the elves have been in the Undying Lands for 3,469 years. And most of that time, Melkor was chained up in Mandos. So, no wonder things were going swimmingly for the most part of the elves' time in the Undying Lands. It was just in the 900 or so years that Melkor was allowed to roam freely that things really started to go downhill. <laughs>